All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Thomas Montgomery. I'm with BCLI and ICS, and we're going to go through a very important topic today called access to capital. And if you have questions, we'll be able to address those primarily at, at the end, uh, at the uh, once we conclude the presentation. So if you need to go, you, you've heard what we wanted to share with you, or if you want to stay online and ask questions or simply hear the questions and answers that others have, that's perfectly fine as well. So you can see here on, on the screen, we're going to start with a quote, and the quote is from the SBA, the United States Small Business Administration. It says, it costs money to start and operate a successful business. Funding your business is one of the first and most important financial choices most business owners make. How you choose to fund your business could affect how you structure and run it. Now, what that means to you may be different to me than to me, but what I take away from it is we, we need to be strategically focused, not just on the business plan and how big we want to be and who we want to service, but how are we going to capitalize this endeavor? Capital can, for a business can only come from three sources, right? It could be debt-based where we borrow it and we promise to pay it back. It could be equity-based where we get a contribution, frankly, out of our own pocket or someone else's where they're not expecting to be paid back because that would be a debt, but they're looking for some sort of long-term benefits for them, maybe an appreciation of your stock or dividends or what have you. Or third is the retained earnings where we just operate a business so effectively, we generate off more profit than we, we um, consume and we reinvest that leftover money. Very, very difficult to start and grow a small business off of retained earnings. So almost always to reach our potential, we're going to need access to capital. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so a quick uh, couple introductions for you. BCLI is our 501c3 nonprofit, started back in 2016. And, and again, that, that's where we got our start. Our focus initially was to help small businesses access capital with a very singular focus business credit. And we'll spend more time talking about that today that might help you understand the, uh, the value of that, at least being part of your capital raise. BCLI is a member of the Money Smart Alliance, which is, uh, which is founded by the FDIC and promoted by the SBA. Secondly, then there is ICS and a group of us that were current and former SBA reps, SBDC advisors, score mentors, and a couple business bankers thrown into the mix, formed ICS's premise based upon the need for a transparent and consistent process that any small business could follow to access capital. So in other words, something with, with assurance and certainty and, and validation. And we'll go through that more as we go along today. We are a member of the Better Business Bureau. We are a member of the local chamber. Um, we, we meet all those check marks. So today we're gonna to go through the access to capital curriculum, very practical information, and it's applicable regardless if you are pre-launch startup or existing business. All right, so a little bit about my qualifications and we'll step right in. I'm one of the funding managers here at ICS, so I have, a pl have the pleasure on a daily basis of helping small businesses raise capital, whether it be loans, lines of credit, revolving accounts, trade lines, investor equity, that's, that's what my daily workload is composed of and absolutely love it. It's, it's a dream job for me. Prior to that, as a full-time college professor, I taught financial literacy, small business management and business principles to credit earning full-time students. And uh, that was interesting and, and enjoyed that as well. I have been a small business development center advisor. So in other words, paid by an SBA grant to work with small businesses and do some of the things that we're going to talk about today. We've just recognized that there's a lot of small businesses left behind. So our approach is a little bit more thorough and uh, results oriented than the government model. But I can tell you a lot of what we talk about, a lot of what we do is, is proven. For instance, in just physical year, fiscal year 2019, 2019, our one small SBDC office in a relatively rural area of East Texas raised about $30 million for small businesses. And if you look at the SBDC offices in major cities, you know, they're, they're much higher than that. So the, 
the, uh, the underlying foundational concepts has been proven for over 20 years. Uh, we started back in 2016, what, three or four years ago, packaging it a little bit differently and have been able to help even more small businesses that would have been left behind otherwise. I was a SCORE mentor and workshop chair in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, came, coming out of graduate school as a senior consultant with Deloitte, worked on large scale financial projects. My largest client during that time was the state of Florida. So I'm not saying some business in the state of Florida, the state of Florida was my client. So education, I have an undergrad, I'm uh, sorry, graduate degree in, in business, MBA in finance, master's in strategic planning, and lastly, a degree in accounting. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about our learning objectives and dig in, right? Your time is valuable. So let's talk about some key variables for accessing capital. We're gonna look at those. We're gonna talk about some secrets of building business credit and accessing capital under your EIN without, without using your personal credit. We're going to talk about some common mistakes that commonly keep small businesses from being able to raise capital, some pitfalls, if you will, and we'll wrap it up and talk about our grant subsidized program. So let's dig in. What are some key variables that impact access to capital? One of the things that is just incredibly important for you to understand is that different sources of capital have different underwriting criteria. And so it's just not unusual for people to make this mistake, but we need to understand different sources of capital have different underwriting criteria. So don't group them all together. So you know, if you ask me a simple question, do I, need to, do I need to have good personal credit to get capital for my business? No, some sources look at that, some don't. Do I need to have a business plan? No, some sources do, some don't. So just avoid the temptation to think that everything has the same set of criteria, because that's just simply not, not the case. All right, so let's move on here. And that did not uh, clear out that, so sorry. There we go. All right, so what are some common sources, some common barriers to accessing capital? Well, certainly if, if the money is there in the middle, I can promise you that there's more than enough capital available through a variety of different institutions to help you reach your potential. The money is there. Furthermore, there is a strong, strong desire to get you that funding so you can access capital. So what's missing is you. What's missing is your ability to identify the right source or sources of capital and your ability to meet the underwriting criteria. So what we're gonna do is, is talk about some of the different types of underwriting criteria and what you might do about that because it's not just, oh, here's where I am now, I'm locked in time. Instead, let's dig a little deeper and see what we might be able to do to improve if, if something is a deficiency or not a strength. So we'll start here kind of at 12 or one o'clock and work our way around. So net worth, in the world of business lending, Many sources of capital, but not all, care about your net worth. And that's usually calculated on what's called a PFS, a personal financial statement. And so that's par. I'm going to give a little check mark here because it's part of what we do. Check. We're going to work with you to create a personal financial statement that's optimized. Now, it has to be truthful, of course, but it's very rare that we see someone that truly has an optimized personal financial statement. There's kind of tricks of the trade, if you will, of how to improve your net worth on paper, and we'll help you do that legally and ethically. So net worth, is it required by all sources of capital? No, none of these are universally applicable, but some sources do. And that's ultimately what you have to figure out is what do you have? You know, if we're going to make dinner tonight together, we need to figure out what ingredients we have. If, if we want to make lasagna, but we have no pasta sauce and no noodles and no cheese, then we're going to have to go to the store. But if we do have bread and, and turkey and lettuce, maybe we're ready to make sandwiches. And so that analogy may not be very accurate or applicable or meaningful to you, but, but, but it really hits to the underlying 
gap that typically exists is you have to reconcile what you have and what you can fix versus going after things that you just don't meet the underwriting criteria for. All right, so moving on to business credit worthiness. So this is things like your Dun & Bradstreet Paydex score, your Experian Business and Telescore, your DBT and other, and we'll talk about those things in the next learning objective. So do you have to have a, a credit worthy business to get access to capital? No. Does it make sense to do that so you have more access to capital? Well, of course, of course. So we're gonna give that a check mark. That's one of the things we're gonna help you do. Let's go over here to revolving utilization. So from a revolving utilization perspective, that means on your credit cards, whether they be business credit cards or personal, are we using more than 30% of the available credit limit? If so, we are considered leveraged. And so that is perceived negatively by the lending world. They think that maybe we're not managing our cash flow, we're, we're under distress, we're living off credit, any or all the above. So we need to keep our revolving utilization below 30%, whether it be off of business, credit cards, or personal. Now, let's say that uh, circumstances don't allow that, so that's lowering your score and reducing your access to capital. Well, we're going to give it a check because one of the things we do through our bridge loan, we literally, literally, literally wire you money to pay off or pay down your credit cards. L literally. Because what happens then? When your credit card balances go down, we can do a rapid rescore, and then all of a sudden your score jumps up because your balances are down and your access to capital has improved. So revolving utilization, does that impact all sources of capital? Of course not. Does it impact some? Yes, and it gets a check mark because it's something that we can help you with. So you see the pattern here. We're going through to take a deeper dive into some different variables because we're going to need to ultimately figure out what ingredients do you have? What are we going to make for dinner? What is your capital raise going to be based off of? Okay, next is verifiable income. Verifiable income could be from your business, or if it's pre-launch, then uh, for, uh, and or from yourself, or what's called global income, which is both from your business or businesses and individual. Now, do all sources of capital require verifiable income? Absolutely not. And we're going to talk more about business credit and, and accessing sources of capital that do not look at personal credit or personal income. But having verifiable income is, is a good thing to have. And in fact, this might surprise you, we can literally help you with that. We can help entrepreneurs become an employee of record of a credible business with a six-digit salary. And what happens then? You have access to more capital because you have more demonstrable, verifiable income to service more debt. So verifiable income, not always checked. In some sources it is, and we give it a check because we can help you with that. Derogatory credit. These are the negative items that could exist on your personal and or your business credit reports. Well, what could a derogatory item be? A common example is are inquiries, too many inquiries. Now, inquiries account for a small amount of your credit score, but it can be a major red flag when it comes to lenders because they're thinking, uh-oh, this person or this business is out shopping everywhere. How much debt are they really taking on and how leveraged are they? Maybe truth is different than what reflects yet. So uh, we can take inquiries off, charge-offs, collections, uh, derogatory items. So the bottom line is you look better on paper. And when you look better on paper, you have access to more capital. So another check. And, and these all won't be checked. So you know, stand, stand at, or sit at the edge of your seat because soon we won't be able to give everything a check mark. Okay, healthy credit mix. More relevant to personal credit profiles than, than business credit, but it, but it has application to both. So it, it's not just having a good score, it's having a good credit mix that's going to increase your access to capital. Let's look at it on the personal side for a second. If you have a thin file, then we probably need to add some primary trade lines. One of the examples is we can add two secured credit cards, which we can pay for. So if money's tight, you don't have to come up with the two or $300 for the secured card. So we get a couple secured cards and then literally what we do is we go in and manipulate the start date of those credit cards so they look older instead of new and manipulate how they report in terms of the credit limit. 
So it looks like a large credit limit instead of a small one. Well, having a couple year, couple trade lines that are multiple years old with perfect payment history and large credit limits and low balances can make a big difference in your credit score, but even more importantly, a huge difference in access to capital because you look better on paper. So another check mark there. Historical financials. There won't be a check mark in this one because this is what it is. If your business has been open, then you should have been filing tax returns. If your business is open, you should have a business bank account, you should have bank statements. If you don't have those things, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. None of these are requirements for all sources of capital, but all of these are requirements for some sources of capital. So you can see the point. We need to figure out, again, what ingredients we have before we decide what we're gonna make for dinner tonight. Financial projections, we do help on this. So this is forward looking rather than historical, putting together income statement balance sheets 36 months out. That's part of what we do with our, our capital ready package, our, our loan packaging. Business plan, you know, everyone tells you need a business plan. And frankly, that's a lie. There's many sources of capital that do not require a business plan. Is it good to have one, of course, from an internal perspective? Is it necessary to have one for a capital raise? No. If we're going to go for a larger, more sophisticated capital raise than it is commonly used. What you have to keep in mind, though, is that there are different types of business plans for different circumstances. So we need to develop a business plan with the reader in mind. And that is part of what we do. Here's another one that doesn't get a check mark. Experience. Some sources of capital look at your industry experience. Here's an example. We have people that come to us for all different types of sources of funding, all different types of industries, all types of businesses. But a common one is this. They want to buy a food truck. Well, great. So we would ask, well, um, Aaron, Aaron's on the call here. Aaron, um, you, you're interested in, in getting a, an SBA loan, which we do a lot of, for a food truck, right? Yep, great. Okay, how many years experience do you have owning a food truck? And let's just say Aaron says, none. Hmm, okay. Aaron, um, how many years have you worked on a food truck? What, what relevant industry experience? None. Now, maybe he's worked in a restaurant or, or he or she, you know, maybe there's something we can draw out of it. But some sources of capital, to no surprise, would like to know that you've done something like this before. And the absence of that can be a barrier. So again, if you go into a bank, they're usually looking for all of this, right? The truth is most of you won't probably yet qualify for traditional bank financing. So we need to look at other sources of capital. So experience, I can't give you a check mark. We can't create that, although we can help you put together your bio. Second to last is time in business. Some people think wrongly that you have to be at least in business two years to get a business loan. That's absolutely incorrect. ICS, we have an SBA loan. We applied for and received a, an SBA loan before we had passed two years in business. And so time in business is relevant. Some sources of capital care about that. A lot of them don't. So no, we can't give it a check mark. We can't create magical time in business but it is worth you knowing that it's not required. And I wanna finish on liquidity and I'm gonna give it two circles because it's so, and we'll go ahead and put the check mark on because it's just so important. Not all sources of capital care about your liquidity, but, but some do. And so that's why we often will go through a multiple tranche or multiple round strategy of raising capital where the early stage, maybe, maybe the first stage is just to pay off some of your revolving utilization that we were talking about here. So we just we pay off credit cards. So that could be the first tranche. The second tranche might be to, to just get some capital in. So we have some working capital to work off of. We can go park some money in the business bank account. So we show we have liquidity. And then thirdly, we go after a larger capital raise. All right, so that was a lot of detail and I'll pick up the pace afterwards, but I think it's important that you step back and realize there's different variables and just use that analogy. What are we gonna make for dinner tonight together? It depends on what ingredients we have. What if there's an ingredient we need that we don't have? Then we're gonna to have to get it because we can't, but let's assume that the recipe for lasagna is traditional. And so we have to have cheese. We have to have the pasta. We have to have the sauce. 
Well, the underwriting criteria for sources of capital is like a recipe. It's already written. My friend, if you'll just simply meet the underwriting criteria, they will send you this money. They want to loan you or they want to invest in your business, but you have to meet the criteria. All right, so let's clear that out because we know it's gonna stick on the next slide and we'll move on to the next slide. All right, so business credit, how does it work? And I'll pick up the speed again, as I promised. So business credit based upon the EIN of your business, not your social security number. Why does this matter? Well, most small businesses fail when they try to start or grow a business. And as I mentioned, there's a formula for approval. If you know the formula and you meet the underwriting criteria, then what happens? You get approved. If you don't know the formula, you're probably guessing and you probably will not get approved. So that's a real simple rule there. All right, moving forward. Most people don't understand that business credit building is different. It's actually significantly different than personal credit. So let's talk about a few key areas. Number one, business credit building always works and it's faster. And I'll show you some examples of, of why that is in a second. Secondly, it's publicly visible. So it's not like personal credit where you have to have permission or authorization to pull someone else's personal credit. Per business credit, we can sit down and pull your business credit profile, any business credits profile. And in fact, I'll even show you some businesses, business credit profiles here in a moment that they didn't give us permission for because you don't have to. Business credit is public information. And then thirdly, which is a, a little concerning, but it's, it's the truth, is that you will have a failing business credit score even, even if you've done nothing wrong. And again, I'll show that to you so it makes more sense. All right, so what is business credit? Again, it's in the business name under the EIN based upon the business's ability to pay, not the business owners. You might say, well, I don't really care about business credit. Well, do you care about accessing capital? Then this is one variable that's very much within your control that we can work together and optimize very, very quickly. And even if you're going after a traditional loan, let's say an SBA loan, they look at business credit. It's part of the credit scoring algorithm. It's called FICO SBSS. FICO has over 50, 50 different credit scoring algorithms. For an SBA loan, which is the example we're talking about, they use a specific type of credit algorithm that takes into consider consideration business credit. So if you've ever applied for an SBA loan, you didn't get approved and you wondered why, this, in fact, might be one of the variables that no one told you mattered, but it very much does. Now, the good news is business is, credit's fast to build, and we can start accessing typically the first five to 10,000 in the first 30 days, so quick. It impacts your borrowing ability, both in terms of getting approved or not, the amounts of the approval and the terms. And again, this isn't according to me, it's according to the SBA. You can borrow 10 to 100 times as much through business credit than you can consumer. And I'll give you a simple example. We're starting to get company cars for our staff here because as they're out driving, we don't want them using miles uh, on their own vehicle. So we bought the first two company vehicles this past week, both under the EIN. So it doesn't report on the owner's personal credit. And you know, each of these is what, 70 to $75,000 and you know, an individual probably wouldn't be able to go out and buy a fleet of vehicles that, that are of that quality and that price, but a business certainly can. So it definitely works. And I'll show you some more examples of that in a moment. So here on this screen, we simply have a screenshot back from 2016 when we first got started, one of our first clients. And it's, it's a screenshot of their Experian business profile. And what you'll see on there is a bunch of zeros and no's and not applicables. But just to, to interpret it for you, what it means is that they've done nothing so far to their business credit profile. So you might say, oh, it's a new start business. No, do not assume that. Many existing businesses look just like this because they've not taken a concerted action to build their business credit worthiness. Bottom left-hand corner, their score, which is in the yellow box, on a scale from one to 100 is a 28. That is not good, right? If you score 28 on a test, that is not good. Now, even though they've done nothing wrong, they still have a failing grade, but notice underneath the credit limit recommendation is still $1,000. 
Well, that's a pretty powerful insight into how this model is different, right? Because if you or I had a 450 or 500 personal credit score, what do you think our credit limit recommendation would be? It'd be zero, right? Because we're, we're not credit worthy on paper. In this case, this client's not credit worthy. This business is not credit worthy on paper. However, they still deserve a chance. And so this is going to be relevant as I show you the next few slides of how quickly we can build business credit. And so they're, they're high risk at this point because of lack, lack of active trade lines. When you have a trade line and extension of credit and you pay on it, which is a payment experience, then that demonstrates that we do what we promise we'll do. We'll pay our bills on time. Even though we haven't not paid our bills on time, like on this screen, no one knows if we will or not. So the more often that we have trade lines with payment experiences, there are more and more reminders to the, or alerts to the outside world that we're paying our bills on time. That's what we're trying to do is to build our business credit worthiness. All right, so now let's just say we added one simple trade line. Madison in our office here, she's an ex-Army vet, ex-military police. She works full-time for us now. She manages the business credit building process on the organic side, which is what I'm showing you here. So what she'll do is help you get that first trade line on, which we did back in September 16 for this business. Bam, score went up, way up, right? We went from a 28 to 96. And then what happened on the credit limit recommendation? It went up, not night and day, but it, it more than doubled. I mean, don't you wish that, that personal credit worked that way? If you had a real bad personal credit score and you can go make one payment on one trade line and could double your borrowing capacity, that'd be a big deal. Well, it doesn't happen that quickly on personal credit, but it absolutely does on business. And this helps reduce our risk. All right, so every successful business has business credit. So these are just a few experience snapshots of how many trade lines some popular name brand businesses have. Facebook has 40 trade lines, Dell 83, Microsoft 131, Apple 138, Pilot 153, and we get all the way to Walmart with 513. I'll be actually in Bentonville, Arkansas next week for a meeting, but unrelated to that, you know, I realize that you and I probably are not running a business the size of Walmart, at least yet, right? But the bottom line is we would be remiss to not consider some of the financial practices and, and, and learning from how larger businesses access capital, because some of the things they do, we might want to mimic or we might want to replicate because it makes good sense. Having strong business credit is one of those, and, and uh, this is an illustration of that. So some key vocabulary on business credit. We've talked a little bit about DNB, Dun and Bradstreet's one of the, the leading business credit bureaus, and you get a Paydex score from them, which is different than the IntelliScore we just looked at for Experian business, but both of them go from um, one or zero to 100. We want to be 80 or above on both. DBT, and, and we can accomplish that pretty quickly within 30 days, usually 30 to 60 days. DBT, you should definitely know what your DBT is because the rest of the world wants to know, especially if they're considering lending you money, and that's your days beyond term. Do you on, on average pay your bills on time or do you pay them late? Uh, DBT, day beyond term, if you have a zero, that's perfect. That means on average you pay your bills on time. Trade lines are extensions of credit that are reflected on the credit reports and payment experiences are when we pay on those, which we've discussed. And then we've seen some examples of credit limit recommendations. So we started with a typical company, which is probably what yours looks like. This is, we'll pull yours for free, of course, and figure out, but typically you're gonna look like this as a starting point, add the first trade line and see some immediate results. You might wonder, well, what if we kept going? What would happen if we kept going with this? Well, we would continue to have low risk, both in, in terms of our IntelliScore as well as our financial stability. But most importantly, look at that bottom number. What did our credit limit recommendation increase to? Almost three quarters of a million dollars just by following this, this routine, this practice, this process. And frankly, you can go do it yourself if you'd like, or we've received a grant to help you do this. So either way, if you wanna do it or you want us to do it, but it's, it's very important to do because how you look to the outside world matters. So we might say, well, how, how exactly do we go about doing this? Well, it starts with setting up your business properly. Remember, I've told you different sources of capital have different underwriting criteria. 
So you're making a mistake if, if what I tell you on this page, you automatically extrapolate or, or project on all sources of capital because it's just not the case. What we're talking about in this slide is for business credit alone. Please keep that in mind. You cannot build business credit off of a sole proprietorship or a DBA. We need to have a business entity, which could be an LLC, C Corp, or S Corp. It could even be a nonprofit. We need to have an EIN. Now you might be thinking, well, I don't have these things in place. Can you guys help me? Well, yes, you don't have to have these as a prerequisite to enroll in the capital ready program. We're just describing these are things that we would need to get. These are ingredients for the lasagna if we're going to make lasagna. And in this example, lasagna is business credit. Now you might say, well, I don't want to go buy cheese. I don't want an EIN or I'm fine with my sole proprietorship. Perfect. Can we still raise $100,000 or more of capital? Absolutely. But it won't be lasagna, right? It's going to be different. We need to have a physical address, commercial address, and a business phone number. Once we've done that, then Madison's going to pull, you're done in Bradstreet, you're experienced business, and if applicable, your Equifax business report, she's going to look at and see if they're optimized. I can tell you, I can promise you that they hardly ever are. And you could be the exception to the rule, but hardly they ever are. There's almost always mistakes. And you might say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's what the rest of the world is seeing. That's what lenders are pulling from to look at your business or even your competitors could be looking at your business credit profile. Your clients or, or prospective clients could be looking at this, especially if you're going after government contracts, Amazon, Walmart, bigger deals. So we need to make sure that your credit profile is set up in term, correctly in terms of your address and your phone number and number of employees and revenue figures and industry codes and so forth. Now, at that point, we are ready. Now, we are ready to go access capital off of your EIN. We can do that two ways. We can do the fast track, and that's what I focus on and specialize in. And we routinely can get around $100,000 in around 30 days. It's the real deal, absolute real deal. Liquid money you know, that you can use for your business. Or we can work with Madison, and she'll help you with the organic build and that's net 30s and then store revolving and then moving on up. So either of those are ways to build business credit. So what are some examples? Here's a $7,000 card, a Visa card, 10,000 Bank of America, 24,000 American Express, 50,000 American Express, but it doesn't stop there, right? There's other sources of capital other than just credit cards. And I've already given you an example of one where we've literally gone out and got two cars for our business under the EIN that does not report on personal credit. Okay, so kind of wrapping it up here, let's go through the last learning objective and it is on the grant subsidized capital ready program. Again, we built this to be a solution to the problem and the solution, uh, the, the problem is most small businesses don't have access to capital. They don't know how to navigate through, they don't know how to understand the underwriting criteria and meet those. So this is applicable regardless if you're pre-launch startup or existing to help you have the capital to start, grow, and reach your potential. Important to know, we do not compete with banks or credit unions. We are not a lender. We're a TA, a technical assistance provider. So we don't have interest rates. We don't have loan terms. We're going to help you identify the right sources of capital, meet the underwriting criteria through this grant subsidized program. We are not the lender. In fact, many lenders refer to us and then we refer them back once they're capital ready. So and several times, and if you take nothing away from today to understand, you know, how do I get capital for my business? Number one, identify the right source or sources based upon your mitigating circumstances. And then number two is meet the underwriting criteria. Buy the ingredients for the lasagna, follow the, follow the recipe and put it together right. And guess what? You're going to have lasagna exactly as the little picture shows, exactly as you expect. So it's, it's, it's not difficult. There's a process to it, but it's not difficult. Now, with that being said, we have a transparent 10-step process. We have a whole YouTube video on our website that you can view that will break it down in more detail than we have time now, but we're gonna assign a financial officer to work with you looking for immediate sources of capital as well as our roadmap for the longer term. Typically, we'll get first round of funding in the first 30 days. 
that have put together a lender compliant business plan and you'll really like the, the interactive software that we use. We do the, the heavy lifting, but of course you're involved. Put together an optimized personal financial statement. Optimize your business and personal credit scores. And so again, you might say, well, do I have to have good business credit to get capital? No, there's some sources of capital that don't care about your business credit. Okay, then do I need to have good personal credit to get capital? No, no. There's different sources of capital. Some don't use personal credit, but some do. I think a wise person would seek to optimize both their personal and business. Now, we work with a law firm that actually will address if you have deficiencies in personal credit in a very innovative way. They'll get you about 75,000 up front, get you to a 750 credit score, because it's not just about getting better credit, it's about getting optimal credit help you remove negatives, help add positive, and even create the verifiable income if needed. So it's a big deal. You may not need the TCR program, but it's just important for you to understand that is an arrow in our quiver because that's an obstacle for many small businesses. They have, they don't look good on paper. We'll create those interim financial statements if needed and financial projections, put together your uses of funds, kind of your, your, uh, your, your shopping list, if we're gonna to go to Sam's to buy the ingredients for the lasagna, then we need to know what it is that we're going to buy because it's gonna determine which store we go to. And that's exactly the case with raising capital. Some sources of capital are applicable to some uses, but not others. And what's innovative is we guarantee, guarantee in writing at least a $100,000 capital raise. Now that's the floor. If you need more, that's fine. There, there's not a maximum capital raise, but that's the minimum. And that's a question actually we have from Felton Lewis. So I'll, I'll clear that. Felton asked, what's the minimum and maximum amounts? 100,000 is minimum. Now you might say, I don't even need 100,000, I need 50,000. Oops, this won't work for me. I, I don't buy that. I mean, you need to make sure you have enough liquidity. You should have at least 90 days of working capital in your bank account. You need whatever it is you planned on buying, whether it be inventory equipment or what have you. Then you also, you know, if nothing else, let's get you a company vehicle. So you've got a new reliable transportation that happens to be fully tax deductible. We can wrap it. You're a walking billboard for your business, for example. I, I don't know that there's many business models that couldn't benefit from at least 100,000. Okay. Where does the money come from? Again, we are not the lender. There's not some magic money tree out back that when you start working with us, it's like, oh, congratulations now, here's some free money. That's too good to be true. So we do a lot with SBA loans, not only, but that's where we got our start from. We do uh, 7A Express loans, which are great. Startups qualify up to $150,000 of working capital, low interest, funds in around 15 days, and uh, only takes a 165 FICO. We have some preferred lenders that we work with on that that we're in contact with every day. Laura from the banks already contacted me during this webinar about one of our clients who just got funded. So 7A Express loans, I think one of the best kept secrets. If we need more, we might want to consider a 504 loan for land, equipment, so forth, tangible assets. Fast seed capital, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 with some flexible underwriting. Uh, UBF, uh, one of our favorites, favorites, favorites. And so this is back what we were saying earlier. Let's get some credit cards under the EIN. That's going to build your business credit worthiness quicker. And it's going to give you some, some liquidity. Usually that's at 0% interest for the first 12, 18, or 24 months. And it's reporting, again, under the EIN, not your social security number. I think every business should have $100,000 of business credit cards. Not meaning that you use it all, but you have that borrowing capacity if needed in a short term. It's, it's almost like a line of credit, right? You can pull from it when you need and uh, pay it off when you can. No collateral needed for the UBF works for startups and existing businesses. And there's a whole bunch of other sources of capital, 401k financing, private equity crowdfunding. We do a lot with real estate financing, 100% real estate financing. Bridge loans like to pay off the, the credit cards we talked about earlier and so forth. Oh my goodness, we've covered a lot of ground. So what are some final tips I'd like you to know and then we'll have a quick quiz and then we'll dig into the questions. So final tips. It's crucial that you first select the right source or sources of capital based upon your mitigating circumstances and then ensure you meet the underwriting criteria. There are sources of capital for every situation. Be optimistic, there's no doubt you can get funded. Now you need to find a capital raise partner, someone that you're going to work with that's gonna help you raise the capital that you need. 
when you select a capital raise partner, you know, look for, I would recommend looking for an entity that has a permanent physical office with credible staff, leadership with significant experience raising capital, and true infrastructure. And here's a quick test. You could ask someone, hey, if, if I need to check my credit, can you pull it in-house or do you have to go to some third party? Well, I know in our case, we pull credit in in-house here personal and business credit. We had to go through all kinds of strenuous background checks on credit and criminal history and credibility to be able to do that. And if someone just simply says, oh, no, you need to go to Credit Karma and get your own credit report, that's a little bit of a red flag, right? They, they've not met those scrutiny or, or the criteria to be able to pull credit themselves. So what? why is that? And then ultimately, you know, we live in a, in a what have you done for me lately society. So we want to make sure that your capital raise partner will guarantee results, right? Time is valuable, guaranteed results. And of course we do, we've talked about that. All right, now if we were together in, in a room at the chamber or a library or church, we would uh, have more interaction. But let me just blast through these review questions and get to your Q&A. There's six questions sitting there waiting for me right now. Why do most small business owners fail when they try to access capital? We've talked about it several times. What's the reason? Number one, they usually don't know what the right source of capital is based upon their mitigating circumstances. And secondly, they usually don't meet the underwriting criteria. What makes business credit different than personal? Oh my goodness, it's faster, it always works, you get more, so forth. New vocabulary, I frankly don't know what you knew before and what you learned, but hopefully, uh, things like DBT, Dun & Bradstreet, Paydex scores were all valuable for you. What did you learn about properly setting up your business? Well, again, first, properly being set up has to be answered in the context of what source or sources of capital we're going after. But if it's to access business credit, there's a few criteria we talked about, including having a commercial address and a business phone number. We talked about a minimum capital raise will help you raise at least 100000 That's what the grant requires us to commit to. So with that, oh my goodness, we covered a lot, and I feel like that uh, I've, I've talked a lot. But let's get into your questions now. And I do encourage you afterwards, if you have to leave now, that's fine. Just get back with whomever invited you and, and uh, let them know what you thought. And uh, you may, you may want to give the Grant Subsidized Capital Ready Program a try. It's $300 to enroll and that covers our cost of onboarding a client, getting all those credit reports we've talked about down in Bradstreet, which aren't free or cheap, over $100, Experian business, Equifax business, and then pulling personal credit reports all have a direct cost. That's what we're offsetting with the, the $300 processing fee. All right, so questions. Henry Lopez asks, do they have to have a corporation or LLC to be in this program? No, we talked about that. Different sources of capital have different requirements. That's not a requirement. Sharif has a $6 billion project. Well, that's a big one. New company with no revenue yet. Well, yeah, I mean, we can, we can help them. Uh, obviously, when there's a B in the capital raise amount, most likely what we're going to have to do is, is probably look at, unless there's significant collateral, an equity-based capital raise, but we help with those frequently. So yes, enroll them and uh, we'll help. Um, the company is located in the USA, but the projects are not. As long as the, the business is US based, we can help. Is it legal to add positive trade lines? It is. And what's the cost if they need an EIN number? Uh, it's zero. You know, you go to IR, the IRS website and request an EIN and it's free and relatively painless. Now there's places you can go pay to do that, but frankly, you can get your EIN number free and easy. All right, if anyone else has a question, if you can tap, type it into the, the Q&A box, we'll address it. Marie, it looks like you may have a question. If you can type it into the Q&A box, we'll address it. And then we're gonna wrap this up for today. We'll wait for her to type, but I, I wanna let you know, I'm really appreciative of, of your time. I know it's precious. Uh, we've got a, a, a very fortunate opportunity to help small businesses navigate this process and get guaranteed access to capital. If you'd like us to assist you with that, uh, we would be happy to. All right, a couple questions. 
what does it cost if they need a corp or LLC? Uh, they would just go to their secretary of state and file for that business entity. If they need some guidance on that, we can help them once they've enrolled or they can even go use an accountant or a CPA or legal zoom or what have you. The cost to form a, a business entity varies by state. In Texas, for example, where we are, it's $25 to form a nonprofit corporation, more expensive for others. What are the immediate steps upon enrollment? Uh, we're going to go into step two, which will be collecting information. Then we're going to do a soft credit pull, fill out the personal financial statement, gather some more documents, pull business credit reports, start working on revenue projections, expense projections, uses of funds. But Aaron, just so you know, there's a 10 step process and it's there on our website. There's a whole YouTube that describes that in detail. Great question though. Uh, Jimmy Lee says he's ready to get started again. Just go to our website. You see it there on the screen, innovativecapitalstrategies.com. Go to the Capital Ready Package page. You can enroll right there, simple and easy. Frank asks, I understand what your company does. How do you get compensated? We're just like a realtor, really, as far as we get paid off of the capital raise that we help you with. So a realtor, like my wife and I, we just closed on a house July 1st of last year. So 6% of, of that was closing costs that went towards the realtors. So the more expensive the real estate, which ours wasn't very expensive, but the more expensive the real estate, the more the realtor makes. Same model with ours that we help clients raise capital and they pay us a success fee or performance fee based upon that. So it's very, very transparent. It's very linear. And there's, there's no upfront cost other than just the $300 processing fee, which covers those hard costs we talked about. Thank you, Heather Hill. She says it's excellent information. Appreciate that. Uh, jo Josiah has kind of a unique question. Yeah, it's not unusual when there's multiple business models involved. And I'll tell you that, that sometimes there is some structuring that we might raise the capital under company A, but really its intended use is company B. So nonprofits are like that. Some sources of capital won't touch a nonprofit. We'll call that company B. So we could help them form easily and quickly a for-profit entity, company A in this example, raise the capital through company A that then transfers the funds to company B. So Josiah, that is not a problem and it's commonly done. It's kind of an advanced strategy, but commonly done. And yes, we help them on that. Uh, we help clients all the way across the country. So the fact that you're in Georgia, Anisha is not a problem. We're a national program. And yes, we'll help them get what they need to meet the underwriting criteria. We'll help them go to the store and buy the ingredients for the, the lasagna if needed. Frank says, thank you. Thank you, Frank, for joining us. Jimmy says the same. Thank you. And then lastly, Frank asks, does the age of the individual have any bearing? No, you, know, you have to be at least 18. There's no upper limit. Um, there, there's no discrimination allowed by lenders based upon advanced age. To me, that's great. You've got more experience. So there's no maximum age. There is a minimum age, which of course is 18. And then uh, lastly, before we wrap it up, Henry asked about home-based businesses. So yeah, we work a lot with home-based businesses and that's great so we can help them successfully raise capital. The, again, the underwriting criteria is going to be dependent upon the sources of capital that we're pursuing what they need to do. So in closing, does a home-based business need a business a commercial address? Depends on the source of capital we're pursuing, right? That's always the answer. All right, well, thanks everyone. Had a great time and enjoyed visiting with you. Have a, a great rest of the day and we look forward to working with you here soon. Thank you.